Early in October of 1869, Claude Monet and Auguste Renoir readied themselves for a painting expedition. Both of the young artists were desperately short of cash. It had taken them all summer long to scrape together enough money to buy their painting supplies. Now they were eager to experiment. Rather than transcribe the details of a scene, they wanted to capture a fleeting moment in time. The shimmer of water, the reflection of light, the movement of people. As Monet and Renoir painted by the River Seine, they were rejecting everything that was expected and traditional in art. And together with a few like-minded artists, they were about to launch what was not just a new style of painting, but a revolution in the world of art. A revolution that would become known as Impressionism. Impressionism is now seen as a very comfortable art. We love it. We find it very serene and pleasing. Impressionist art, when it happened, was the toughest, most radical, most challenging art of any period in history. It was one of the big breaks in the history of art. There's a story in Impressionism of overturning the past and starting the history of art all over again. But there's also a marvelous story of a group of individuals who were so different and so brave and so humorous and so willing to work with each other that they could make this incredible thing in the history of art happen. Claude Monet, uncompromising and demanding of himself and everyone around him. He expected fame and wealth from the beginning. Auguste Renoir was nostalgic and respectful of artistic tradition. A painter of modern life, Renoir would eventually turn his back on all that was modern. Berthe Morisot was brilliant at maintaining an image of absolute respectability at a time when it was not respectable for a woman to be a professional artist. Camille Pissarro considered himself an anarchist, but in practice, he was kind and soft-spoken. His friends thought of him as God the Father. Edgar Degas was argumentative and obsessive. A perfectionist until the day he died, Degas could barely bring himself to call a work finished. They shared one simple but entirely radical idea, that it was time to discard the rules of the past and paint what they saw through their own eyes, through what they called their sensation.
In the spring of 1859, a young, aspiring painter took the long journey from the Normandy coast to Paris. The young painter was 19-year-old Claude Monet. He was eager to get his first look at the Salon, the state-run art show. The Salon was a huge event. Hundreds of thousands came each year to see art jammed floor to ceiling in gallery after gallery. In 1859, there was no such thing as Impressionism. The art on display was academic art. And the most respected works were full of mythological or religious themes and were known as history paintings. Monet hoped to one day have his art exhibited at the Salon, for acceptance in the Salon was the only way an artist could gain real recognition. But Monet had no intention of making history paintings. Still, he did want to stay in Paris and develop his craft as a painter. His father agreed to help him with an allowance, if he studied with an established master. Monet took the allowance, but ignored his father's wishes. He joined the Académie Suisse, which wasn't actually an academy but a space where artists could come to draw the nude without instruction. When his father found out, he was furious. The long-standing tale is that his father cut him off. He felt that uh, if he wasn't going to be part of a studio, that this was not the way he's supposed to go about a career, that uh, if he was going to live higgledy-piggledy in Paris, then that was his choice, so he would have to make it on his own. It was still normal for an artist to have to go through a process of drawing from casts and then drawing from the live model and learning from the art of classical antiquity. Monet already felt when he first went to Paris in 1859 that an artist should learn from what he saw around him and not learn from formal rules. And at the same time, he's clearly somebody who cultivated an image as a teenage rebel. He's always concerned with projecting an image of somebody who acquired notoriety not only through his art, but actually through who he was. I could never bend to any rule, Monet once said, even as a very small child. Claude Monet was born November 14, 1840, the second son of Louise Justine and Adolphe Monet. They were hardworking merchants in the port town of La Havre. The young Monet had little interest in school, and he spent as much time as he could on the cliffs and beaches around Le Havre. From early on, he loved to draw. By the time he was a teenager, Monet was making caricatures of notable Le Havre citizens. He was quite good at it, and before long, the local stationer displayed Monet's drawings in the shop window. His work sold well, at 20 francs apiece. While at the stationer's one day, he met a local landscape artist, Eugène Boudin. I hope you are not going to confine yourself to this sort of thing, Boudin said. And he invited Monet to paint with him in the open air along the Normandy coast. Boudin helped spark Monet's passion for landscape painting, a passion that would never leave him. Monet described his work with Boudin as if it were like the rending of a veil. I understood, he said, what painting could be. My destiny as a painter opened up before me. Monet probably expected to be famous from very early on. The first painting from his hand is a highly accomplished picture that was submitted to an exhibition in La Havre in 1858, and it is spectacular. 
It is also the, an example of an artist who was truly gifted. So he knew he had it within himself to go down into history, and he was determined to do it. In the spring of 1859, Monet left Le Havre carrying his art supplies and his life savings of 2,000 francs. He was headed for the capital of art, Paris. At the Académie Suisse, Claude Monet met another student who had no interest in academic training. His name was Camille Pissarro, a 29-year-old from the West Indies island of St. Thomas. Like Monet, Pissarro wanted to portray everyday life rather than the mythology of the past. Pissarro had in fact painted scenes of everyday life from the time he was a boy in St. Thomas. From the beginning, he sketched these portraits of young slaves, but with none of those kind of sentimental, fatherly type of approach. There's a directness and a simplicity that was very, very unusual. Uh, clearly, he, he felt very much at home with people of a different context, of a different social uh, milieu from his. Pissarro felt at home with people of a different social milieu because he did not feel at home within his own community. Pissarro's father, Frédéric, a Jewish immigrant from Bordeaux, France, had married a member of his own family, his Aunt Rachel, breaking Jewish law. The Jewish community in St. Thomas would forever scorn the Pissarros for this illegitimate union. Camille Pissarro was the ultimate outsider. St. Thomas is a small place, and when your mom and dad aren't legitimately married and, you know, they can't, they're not recognized in the synagogue and the other Jews don't like them and blah, 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 it's a, it's a kind of situation in which you have to learn to persist and to keep on going. By the time he was a teenager, Pissarro knew he wanted to be an artist. But his father wanted him to help run the family store. Pissarro's father expected his son to pick up the business and to become a dutiful son uh, who would uh, follow his parents' footstep. Not only did he not do that, he ran away from home to become what? An artist, God forbid. This is just something that was absolutely unacceptable. When Pissarro ran away in 1852, he left behind his middle-class life determined to make his way as an artist. He traveled through the West Indies and on to Venezuela. And in 1855, he settled in Paris. Once there, he managed to reconcile with his parents. They had recently moved to Paris themselves and set up housekeeping with a generous staff of servants. One of the servants was 21-year-old Julie Vallée. She posed for Pissarro in 1858, and the two secretly began an affair. He happened to fall in love with a very simple, simple woman who barely could read not even the cook of his parents, but the cook's help. When Pissarro broke the news to his parents, it gave them the shock of their lives. Julie was not only a lowly servant girl, she was Catholic and she was pregnant. Well, Pissarro's mother just absolutely refused to have anything to do with Julie. The Pissarros fired Julie and cut off their son's allowance.
Julie suffered a miscarriage. But Pissarro refused to leave her. They would go on to have eight children over the next 21 years. And their relationship would last the rest of their lives. Pizarro's mother never acknowledged Julie, but before long, she put aside just enough of her outrage to send her son a small monthly allowance. Camille Pizarro escaped the family turmoil by concentrating ever harder on his landscape painting and figure drawing. While sketching the nude at Academy Suisse late in 1859, Pissarro met Claude Monet. Pissarro and Monet were soon off together on painting expeditions. They portrayed scenes that had traditionally been considered unworthy of attention. A telegraph tower, an open field, a dreary factory. They painted subjects that were not imbued with cultural meaning. If I went out and, and painted the suburbs, you'd think, oh my God, you know, what is this? Is there any meaning in this? And that was what the French thought. By choosing their own countryside, they did something radical. They did some, they made images out of, of an unholy or an unhistorical landscape. There's no doubt that the notion that we, in the 19th century, that is, were in a new age, contributed to the desire for artists and for musicians and like to be able to look at their time and to find the values in that moment. Not to look to the past or to mythology, but to really look at the ways in which their own civilization was reshaping the concepts of the world. Monet could not have been happier, except for one thing. Between his painting trips, the studio costs, and his particular enjoyment of big city nightlife, Monet was living beyond his means. His savings of 2,000 francs was quickly depleted. Life could be relatively cheap if somebody had somewhere to live. Obviously, subsistence is one thing, comfort is something else, and Monet certainly, ideally, expected comfort. He always loved uh, fancy shirts with ruffles on it. He liked to drink better wines. So there were occasions when, plenty of occasions, when he was short of ready cash. But Monet did not get much time to make his way in Paris. In March of 1860, he was conscripted into the peacetime army for seven years of service. Monet's father offered to pay the government for a replacement for his son, a common practice for those wealthy enough to afford it. In return, he wanted his son back home to help in the family store. Claude Monet refused the offer and instead opted to join the cavalry in Algeria. He felt that an adventure in Algeria was preferable to a mundane life as a shopkeeper. But Monet paid a heavy price for his decision. His career as an artist was now on indefinite hold. Early in 1861, Auguste Renoir enrolled in L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the School of Fine Arts, the training ground for academic artists. 
At the age of 20, Renoir had already had a successful career as a porcelain painter. But at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, he soon ran into trouble. Renoir had entered a studio class run by Charles Glaire, an academic artist who insisted on the primacy of drawing, line, and form. Renoir liked to paint with brighter colors. Glaire was concerned that devilish color, as he called it, might go to a student's head. As polite and as respectful of authority as he was, I think when he came to paint and draw, even from a very early time, he did not accept any uh, tutelage. He was not prepared to have someone tell him that this was not the way to do it. Glare saw little promise in Renoir, and Renoir's wealthier classmates saw him only as an outsider. He starts off coming from a, a lowly background. Renoir gets himself into a quite different world because he becomes a fine artist. He moves from being an artisan or a decorator to painting fine art for art exhibitions. He goes into this world that people associated with elevated status, which is totally different from these humble backgrounds that he came from. Renoir had grown up the sixth child of seven in the slums that stood in the shadows of the Louvre. But instead of running with the boys in his neighborhood, he roamed through the great museum, absorbing the work of the masters. As a little boy, Auguste decorated the walls of his home with drawings made from charcoal he'd taken from the stove. When he turned 15, his parents apprenticed him to a porcelain painter. His new boss was impressed, and the young Renoir was soon earning the handsome salary of 20 francs a month. Renoir carefully saved every centime he could to fund his art education. And in 1861, he began his official studies in the studio of Charles Glaire. I was always quiet in my corner, very attentive, very docile, studying the model, listening to the teacher, and it was I who they called the revolutionary, Auguste Renoir. Renoir kept up his studies at Glare's for month after month, doing his best to capture the line and form of the model. Renoir had been at Glare's for an entire year when three new students entered the studio. And soon, he was part of a circle of like-minded friends, which included Frédéric Basile, a 21-year-old with plenty of money, Alfred Sisley, a Parisian born of English expatriates, and a 22-year-old, fresh out of the army, Claude Monet. After a year of peacetime cavalry service, Monet had come down with typhoid fever and was sent home to recover. Adolphe Monet once again offered to buy out his son's army service. And this time, he would allow the young Monet to go back to Paris to paint. But first, he made his expectations clear. Get it into your head that you are going to work seriously this time. I want to see you in a studio, under the discipline of a reputable master. If you decide to be independent again, I shall cut off your allowance without a word. Monet immediately set off for Paris. And in the autumn of 1862, he entered the studio of Charles Glaire. Like Renoir before him, Monet ran into trouble with Glaire. Not bad. Not bad at all, that thing there. But it is too much in the character of the model. He has enormous feet. You render them as they are. All that is very ugly. When one draws a figure, 
one should always remember the art of classical antiquity. Charles Clare. I can only paint what I can see, Monet replied. He stayed with Glare to keep his father happy, but he was an uninterested student. Monet soon led his new friends, Renoir, Sisley, and Basile, out of the studio to paint landscapes in the open air. Camille Pissarro, Monet's friend from the Académie Suisse, joined in their expeditions. Monet drove himself hard, and he pushed his friends to do the same. Monet puts himself under a lot of pressure physically when he's working. And I'm sure that when his friends were working with him, that he would have expected them to do just the same. And as he was, in a sense, the leader, the most charismatic of them, I'm sure they'd have followed suit. They would have done what he asked in order to show that they were worthy of tagging along with this great force of nature that he was presenting himself as. Monet had established himself as the leader, the driving force behind his small band of artist friends. Monet, Renoir, Sisley, and Pissarro would be at the center of a new movement in art. It would be a decade before this movement would be called Impressionism. In Paris, early in 1863, Claude Monet and Frédéric Basile went to see the work of Édouard Manet, a 31-year-old painter whose work, The Bath, had suddenly captured all attention. But the attention was all negative. The public stared with open jaw. The critics raged. And even Emperor Napoleon III weighed in, deeming the work immodest. With The Bath, which he later renamed Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Édouard Manet catapulted himself into the limelight and into position as the new leader of the avant-garde. He had violated the academic rule that nudes were to look like goddesses. Manet's nude appeared to be a modern Parisian woman. I think that after the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Manet is always visible. People remembered that picture. And certainly for younger artists who were looking at modern life subjects, like the group that turns out to be the Impressionists, Manet is there, absolutely a focus, and also a personal friend, a supporter, when they all get to know each other. And they all got to know each other at the Café Gerbois. Claude Monet brought his friends, Sisley and Basile, as well as Renoir and Pissarro. Edouard Manet was a fixture there. And Manet's friend, the painter Edgar Degas, often showed up, started an argument, and then left in the middle of it. Manet had first met Degas at the Louvre in 1861. For Degas, the Louvre was the Holy of Holies. It was his temple. Um, he wasn't a religious man, but if he had a religion, it was art, and that's where he went to, to, to worship and pay homage. He would go there regularly to copy, to draw, all the way through his life. The masters must be copied again and again and only after having given every indication of being a good copyist 
can you reasonably be given leave to draw a radish from nature? Edgar Degas. Degas had first applied to copy the masters at the Louvre a decade earlier, just after he'd finished his schooling in 1853. He worked to perfect his technique in preparation for his first submission to the one and only major art exhibition each year, the Salon. But a year passed, and then another, and Degas seemed unable to paint anything he thought satisfactory. His father, Auguste, who had been supporting his grown son with an ample allowance, grew impatient. Our Raphael is still working, but he has yet to turn out a finished product. Meanwhile, the years are slipping by. Auguste Degas. Auguste was a banker who seemed to pay more attention to Renaissance art than to managing finances. Edgar Degas' mother, Celestine, had died when he was only 13 years old. And Edgar, the oldest of five children, seemed to keep his grief to himself. Frankly, Degas lacked love. He grew up, I think, emotionally stunted, for want of a better word. And perhaps he never really caught up. He never really made good. Degas got his own studio in 1859 and spent much of his time there alone. It seems to me, Degas said, that if one wants to be a serious artist, one must constantly immerse oneself in solitude. Degas found himself lonely and depressed. He painted his own image over and over again, always with the same dark expression. He was easily discouraged, doubted his own ability, worried endlessly. As a young man, there were moments when he really withdrew into himself. There were periods of his life that we can point to where he seems to have gone through something that would be called depression today. He continued to paint history painting after history painting. And he still was not satisfied with his work. Degas would make sketch after sketch, revise, make preliminary compositions, revise again. Then he would start his final version on canvas, only to scrape off and begin again. What Degas was trying to do was probably impossible. One side of him was telling him, as a young artist, he needed to paint these big, grand, ambitious compositions in a rather traditional manner, uh, which would go in the salon and announce his talent. Another part of him was pulling him in a completely different direction. He was getting interested in modern life painting, and that dichotomy that he was, he had his feet still in the past, but his, his artistic world was that of the, of the modern, late 19th century, uh, was tearing these pictures apart in some ways. Degas kept on creating history paintings, but he also began, in the autumn of 1861, to paint modern subjects. 
Degas enjoyed the horse races and endlessly sketched scenes at the track. But instead of placing the horses in the midst of a mythical battle, Degas painted them as he saw them. With the horse races, Degas had found a subject that he would return to again and again. In about half a dozen pictures, he experimented with modern techniques for bringing across, for example, the excitement of being in a crowd of people, uh, watching horses moving at great speed, and the sense of bustle and the sense of noise and so on that you get at a racetrack. He cuts off horses at the side of the picture. He puts in bright colors in the, in the jockey's shirts and in the, um, the saddles, etc. He's really trying to make new, lively, quite disruptive painting. Degas was still an unknown painter in 1865. But his friend Edouard Manet was once again on center stage. Manet's salon submission, Olympia, a painting of a woman who appeared to be a prostitute, generated even more outrage than had his Dejeuner sur l'herbe two years earlier. Manet did receive congratulations on some seascapes, but the congratulations did not make him happy, for the seascapes weren't by Manet but by Monet. Manet, the great figure of that moment, had this very controversial nude painting there. And uh, right nearby was Monet's beautiful picture of uh, the beach at Saint Adresse. Critics came along and then were saying, is it Manet, is it Monet, is it Manet, is it Monet? And of course, the young pup Monet, being junior to Mr. Manet, was undoubtedly pleased with that kind of confusion, whereas the elder Manet, it is often said, was a little distressed that somebody was either appropriating his fame or indeed even confusing with his name. Confusion aside, Monet was in fact well received. He had submitted his work to the Salon for the first time that year, and the critics immediately took notice. Monsieur Monet, unknown yesterday, has made a reputation by this picture alone. His seascape is the most original and supple, the most strongly and harmoniously painted, to be exhibited in a long time. The praise lifted his spirits but it did not fatten his wallet. Monet was low on money. But this didn't stop him from making big plans. From Paris, he traveled to Fontainebleau Forest, where he began work on a large-scale painting for the Salon. He would name it Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Luncheon on the Grass. Monet hoped the painting would make him famous. But this time, his outsized ambition would get the best of him. My dear Basile, if you don't answer me by return mail, I'll think you've refused to help me out. I'm in despair. I beg you, my dear friend, don't leave me in the lurch. I no longer think of anything but my painting. And if I don't manage to bring it off, I think I'll go mad. Monet. Claude Monet was in Fontainebleau Forest in the summer of 1865, waiting for Basile to come pose for his new painting. While he waited, he painted the effect of light filtering through leaves, and he painted studies in preparation for a work he would call Déjeuner sur l'herbe. Basile finally arrived in late August, ready to model for several of the figures. 
Monet had a female model with him as well, 19-year-old Camille Doncieux. He was doing something that was really insanely ambitious. He was trying to do something that would, in some ways, outshadow Manet's famous Dejeuner sur Lab. As Monet stood painting at his easel one morning, he was suddenly struck in the leg by an errant throw of a metal discus. Basile helped him into bed and rigged up a mechanism to drip cool water on the wound to reduce the swelling. With Monet unable to stand on his injured leg, the only artwork that got finished was Basile's, the improvised field hospital, painted in their room at the inn, Lyon d'Or. In October of 1865, Monet returned to Paris and started his final version of Déjeuner sur l'air on a canvas that stood 15 feet high and 20 feet long for a grand total of 300 square feet. This vast canvas the Stégené sur l'Herbe was going to be the biggest painting he'd ever painted. Monet was very ambitious. He was ambitious from the beginning, and everybody knew it. But early in 1866, after eight months of struggle, Monet stopped working on Déjeuner sur l'Herbe. He decided that he could not finish the painting in time for the salon. Not long after Monet abandoned his huge project, Edouard Manet changed the name of his The Bath to Déjeuner sur l'herbe. Manet, Degas commented, could do nothing but imitate. Meanwhile, Monet was determined to get something substantial done for the salon. He borrowed a fancy green dress for his model Camille and quickly set to work. He was trying to meet the salon deadline. Monet didn't waste time worrying about the pose or the style of the dress. It appears, in fact, that he took his inspiration from the pages of a popular fashion magazine. In the 1860s, Emile Zola had written of the group, which would become called the Impressionists, that they wanted to be able to capture the beauties of their moment. And that is a concept which ran very deeply through Monet and other Impressionists. Monet worked furiously, almost nonstop. He'd again set himself a steep challenge. The portrait of Camille was life-size, on a canvas that stood nearly eight feet tall. Nonetheless, Monet managed to finish in a matter of days, just in time to submit his painting to the Salon jury in March of 1866. The jury found his woman in a green dress acceptable, and Claude Monet was in the salon for the second year in a row. And for the second year in a row, he received glowing reviews. Now there is a temperament, the journalist Emile Zola commented. There is a man among eunuchs. With the help of the favorable notices, Monet was able to sell several paintings. With money in his pocket, he traveled to Ville d'Avray to paint for the summer. Monet wanted to take the idea of painting out of doors, en plein air, to a new level. Claude Monet was ready to make a clean break with the past. Claude Monet settled in to Ville d'Avray for the summer of 1866. With him was his young model for woman in the green dress, Camille Doncieux. Only by now she was more than just his model. She was his mistress. Monet asked Camille to pose for several figures for his next painting, women in the garden. He was looking to capture the natural effects of light, 
and Monet felt that this could only be done outdoors, with his subject before him from the first brush stroke to the last. The practice of painting en plein air or out of doors was actually a very old practice. But when Monet decides to paint pictures exclusively out of doors, not touched up in the studio, that was radical. Auguste Renoir, meanwhile, was in Paris, working in a style that was anything but radical. He was making a history painting portraying Diana, the goddess of the moon and hunt. He's still looking to make a name for himself in some ways in the traditional way. He's still looking to paint on a scale that will be acceptable at the Salon. Renoir has no safety net. He his parents, who are retired in Louveciennes, as far as I know, he never asked them for a penny for his art. Late in March of 1867, Renoir and Monet submitted their work to the Salon. And they were both rejected. Nearly a year of planning and work ended in failure. To the Salon jury, their paintings simply were not academic enough. Even Renoir's history painting, Diana, was rejected because it did not have the perfectly blended colors and smooth surface that was demanded by the jury. Without a showing at the Salon, Renoir and Monet had little hope of making any money off their year's work. And Monet desperately needed money his mistress Camille was pregnant. This time, Monet got lucky. He sold Women in the Garden for an incredible sum, 2,500 francs. The buyer was his wealthy friend, Frédéric Basile. Basile would pay Monet 50 francs a month out of his allowance. Basile then wrote Monet's father on his friend's behalf, begging him to help his son. But Adolf Monet refused to send any money. Instead, he offered free room and board for his son, but not for Camille. We assume that when Monet had set up with Camille that there was a problem with the family, that they simply felt that this was a bridge too far, that, OK, what went on in Paris behind closed doors was one thing, but having a mistress and an illegitimate child was something that was really a social stigma and that this was something that they simply couldn't be seen to be supporting. In June of 1867, Monet accepted his father's offer and returned to his boyhood home on the Normandy coast. Before leaving Camille, he found a medical student who agreed to attend the delivery in exchange for a painting. On August 8, 1867, Camille gave birth to their baby, a healthy boy she named Jean. Monet could not even afford the train fare to visit his new son. He wrote to Basile to ask for an advance payment on his purchase of women in the garden. He was desperate to send money to Camille, but Basile did not reply. August 12th. You've been stubborn about answering me. I sent you letter after letter, rapid post. Nothing got a rise out of you. I've had to ask strangers for loans and subject myself to insults. I'm very angry with you. August 20th. I didn't think you'd abandon Naturally, me like this. I no longer attribute your silence to an oversight. It's very wrong. So I no longer dare believe in your friendship. I'm in greater need than ever. You know why. I'm sick over it. October 4th. If you don't answer me, everything will be finished. I didn't think us. you would abandon me like this. One last really time. is too bad. I tell you, I'm in desperate straits. I've waited for the postman, and every day, it's the same. It pains me to think of his mother, 
having nothing to eat. I think Monet used Basile as uh, some sort of money purse at various points, but at the same time, Basile at times is very willing to help out when he could, but at times Monet's constant letters must have been thoroughly aggravating. Early in 1868, Monet sold a still life and was able to rejoin Camille and their baby Jean. They settled at an inn where Monet planned to paint for the spring. But before long, he ran out of money yet again, and the innkeepers ran out of patience. They threw Monet and his little family out into the night without even allowing them to gather their belongings. Monet found lodgings for Camille and Jean, and then set out for Le Havre, where he intended to inquire about a commission. When he stopped to change trains, instead of continuing on to Le Havre, Monet began walking toward the Seine. By the time he arrived at the river, he found himself in such a state of melancholy that he threw himself headlong into the water. Claude Monet was 27 years old when he threw himself into the Seine. He was overwhelmed by debt and gloomy about his future. But he forced himself to swim back to the river's edge and pull himself out. The next day, Monet sat down and scribbled a short note to Basile. June 29th, 1868. I was certainly born under an unlucky star. My family has no intention of doing anything more for me. I was so upset yesterday that I was stupid enough to hurl myself into the water. Fortunately, no harm came of it. Monet. It was much more likely to be exasperation rather than a serious attempt to end everything. I think there's a sense in which he's always driven and he is somebody who was immensely ambitious. And you feel that there is a real sense of perseverance, of sort of dogged determination to win out in the end. Monet got back on the train and continued on to Le Havre. Once there, he paid a visit to an art collector and won a commission to paint several portraits. To top it off, Monet sold two of his seascapes. After Monet finished work on the portraits that fall, he took Camille and two-year-old Jean and moved to the Paris suburb of Bougival. Nearby lived Renoir, Sisley, and Pizarro. Camille Pizarro, like Monet, had been struggling. The 100 francs a month he received from his mother was never enough. Pizarro had to support his mistress, Julie, and their two children. So Pizarro took work painting canvas window blinds. One of his friends could not resist painting a view of the fine artist reduced to working as an artisan. Monet, though, would not even consider picking up other work to help pay the bills. And as the summer of 1869 progressed without a sale, Monet could hardly afford to buy food for his family. The idea that a painter would wait tables, for example, is really a more modern idea. Most painters in the 19th century, if they were going to be painters, survived on the thinnest of lines economically and made do as best they could. Uh, it was a question of devoting yourself utterly to painting and hopefully having some kind of family support. Renoir did his best to help the Monets, 
bringing leftover food from his parents' house whenever he could. Renoir, though, was himself out of money. My dear Basile, I'm staying with my parents, and I'm almost always at Monet's. They can't hold out much longer. They don't eat every day. I'm doing almost nothing because I don't have many colors. Things may go better this month. If they go better, I'll write you. Renoir. Meanwhile, Edgar Degas was able to concentrate fully on his art. He did not need to sell. At 35 years old, he still lived on a generous allowance from his father. He kept himself constantly focused on his art, always striving for perfection, always pushing to break new ground. He always seems to have been a step ahead of the company in terms of thinking about what was going on. Um, and people became a bit fearful of him for that reason, that he wasn't somebody that you argued with. He would just cut the ground from under your feet. Degas kept himself ahead of the pack by constantly experimenting. He experimented with modern life themes, with the effect of artificial light, and with compositions that gave a sense of capturing a moment in time. But by the late 1860s, Degas could no longer ignore the fact that something was wrong with his eyesight. Bright light pained him. One eye refused to focus. His eye doctor gave him bad news. Degas had an irregular field of vision in his left eye, and in his right eye, almost no vision at all. Degas was thrown into despair, terrified that he was going to be completely blind. His world revolved around his painting and Degas could not shake the feeling that his world was soon to end. Edgar Degas was just in his 30s when his eyesight began to fail him. He was tormented by the thought that his art career was ending. He begins to worry that he's going to go blind and have periods of depression because, of course, it's the worst possible thing if you're an artist. You can argue that his awareness of his sight problems makes him a more interesting artist and maybe even a better artist because he thought about sight. When you read his notebooks, you get a sense of how he wants to do new things, to see the world at new angles, to look at the city from above, from below. He does this wonderful pastel, I think it is, of a circus performer suspended from the ceiling, but he gets her from below at a very odd angle. So he really wants to see things new. And I think a certain kind of objective distance. He doesn't want to make things pretty. Because he refused to make things pretty, he almost lost a good friend. On an evening in 1868, Degas visited with Edouard Manet. As always, Degas brought his sketchbook. And when Madame Manet, an accomplished pianist, began to play, Degas began to sketch. Degas returned to his studio to paint the scene. And when he was finished, he gave the work to the Manets as a gift. Edouard Manet took one look at it and suddenly slashed the canvas nearly in half, cutting out the portrait of his wife at the piano. He thought that Degas had made her look ugly. 
Degas was furious that his painting was ruined. But when a friend later asked if he was still mad at Manet, Degas replied simply, well, how could anyone stay on bad terms with Manet? Manet was known for being charismatic, urbane, even charming. Degas, on the other hand, was known to be difficult, remote, and overly argumentative. With his fellow male artists, he could be very dismissive and very critical. His relationship with the women artists he was meeting as a young man are slightly different. He was clearly attracted, for example, to Bette Morisot, who was a very beautiful young woman, and she moved in a sophisticated, cultured family, family society. And he fell a little bit in love with her uh, towards the end of the 1860s. It never came to anything. He wasn't at all adept at making love in the 19th century sense. Edna. Monsieur Dugas came and sat next to me, pretending he was going to court me. But his courting was confined to a long commentary on Solomon's proverb, woman is the desolation of the righteous. I certainly do not find his personality attractive. He has wit, but nothing more. Your sister, Bert. Degas was a regular at Madame Morisot's Tuesday night dinners, and he would become lifelong friends with Bert Morisot. The Morisot family was very well connected, and I think this was very important for Bert Morisot when she was growing up particularly, as a young woman, to have people like Edouard Manet visit the home, to listen to conversation which went beyond the domestic or beyond the uh, local concerns of an upper-middle-class family. As teenagers in the 1850s, Bert and her older sister Edma learned to paint. Like most other lessons girls of the Morisot's class received, their painting lessons were simply to allow them to appear well-rounded enough to attract a suitable husband. But Bert and Edma took their art seriously. After they'd been painting for only a few years, Madame Morisot received a disquieting letter from their instructor. With characters like your daughters, my teaching will make them painters, not minor amateur talents. Do you really understand what that means? In the world of the grand bourgeoisie in which you move, it would be a revolution. I would even say a catastrophe. There were so many arguments that to be a woman artist would sap one's femininity, would make it impossible to be married, would make it impossible to be a good mother, would make it impossible even to be a good-looking woman. And the biggest problem was that women were officially barred from any number of art institutions. The Morisot girls were determined to press forward. Madame Morisot, though, was worried that neither Edma nor Bert were concentrating on the real goal, marriage. In 1868, Edma was 28, Bert 27, and Madame Morisot felt it was about time they each found a husband. So she paraded suitors through the house. She made comments about her daughter's fading looks, but neither Edma nor Bert showed the slightest interest in marriage. Both girls, it seemed, were infatuated with Edouard Manet. I definitely think he has a charming character, Bert said. He pleases me infinitely. But Manet was already married. Bert called Manet's wife his fat Suzanne. And when Manet accepted a young woman as his student, Bert was instantly jealous. Manet 
Manet was interested enough in Bert to ask her to pose for him. He was so taken by the dark, intelligent, even mysterious look that Morisot gave him in The Balcony that he went on to make 13 more portraits of her. Morisot was never alone with Manet. Through the many sittings, Bert's mother was a constant chaperone. Madame Morisot was displeased that her daughter was not spending her time more wisely. Bert Morisot persisted long past the age when she should have given up painting and gotten married according to conventional standards of femininity. And she became a driven artist in a way that alarmed and saddened her mother. Edma, though, succumbed to the pressure. And in March 1869, she married. With Edma gone, Bert became filled with self-doubt. Morisot was very tough on herself. She was never complacent. She was never satisfied. She was tormented in many ways. Somehow she'd internalized a kind of negative self-image. She wonders often whether she should give it up. At the point that her sister marries and has a baby, Morisot herself is tormented and says, should I give up painting too? Is it worth pursuing? It's such a struggle. Dearest Edma, I'm sad. I feel lonely, disillusioned, and old. I've done absolutely nothing since you left, and this is beginning to distress me. My painting never seemed to me as bad as it has in recent days. The sight of these daubs nauseates me. Bert. Morisot suffered with what she called lamentation mania. For her, there were times when both art and life seemed too much to bear. Bert Morisot struggled to pull herself from depression. Unmarried at the considerable age of 28 and her art career going nowhere, Morisot felt nothing but anguish. But early in the summer of 1869, she forced herself out of the house for a painting trip. She traveled over 500 kilometers to her sister Edma's house in Lorient, on the coast of Brittany. Once there, she was ready to paint. The trip would mark a new beginning for both Morisot and her art. Morisot was in a mood to experiment. She tried new techniques to portray light and brightness. She adopted a broader brush stroke. And she worked hard to portray a feeling of a moment captured. When she returned to Paris in September, she invited Manet over to see her harbor at Lorient. Manet couldn't quite understand why she'd left it in what he considered an unfinished state. But nonetheless, he liked it. Manet looks at it and says, I'd like to have that painting. And all of a sudden, Morisot thinks, oh, Manet, the great painter of his generation, he wants one of my pictures. And I think that was 
the moment at which she thinks to herself, yes, I am going to be also a great painter of my generation. Not long after Morisot returned from Lorient, Monet and Renoir were preparing to go on a painting expedition of their own. It had taken them the entire summer to scrape together enough money to buy their painting supplies. Now, in early October, they were ready. They went across the river from Louveciennes to a nearby swimming area called La Grenouillère, the frog pond, and they began to experiment. Monet and Renoir wanted to capture the shimmer of water, reflection, movement, a fleeting impression, And to do so, they began using short strokes, commas, or dots. They left brush marks distinctly visible, and they paid close attention to the individual highlights of reflected color. Monet's and Renoir's experiments at La Grande Nouillère marked the debut of the Impressionist style. There are many moments when one might say Impressionism came into this world, kicking, screaming, slightly messy. But um, certainly in the late 1860s, when Monet and Renoir were painting at La Grandière, in addition to turning to contemporary life, they wanted to literally be able to heighten the impact of their work through formal means, color, brushwork, novel compositions, and this was an absolutely calculated affair. This idea of capturing the ephemeral, that modernity consists in pinning down what goes by so quickly, that modernity is captured in a minute, a second, a fraction of a second. This was part of the Impressionist impulse. The Impressionist impulse was not just shared by Monet and Renoir, but by Morisot, Sisley, and Pissarro. They were creating art that captured the modern moment. But the art world was not at all prepared for such a break with the past. In the spring of 1870, Claude Monet decided he would challenge the Salon jury and submit his experimental work from La Grande Nouillère. Renoir opted to play it safe and chose more conservative paintings, The Bather and A Woman of Algeria. The jury accepted Renoir's work. Monet's was rejected. Monet did his best to put his disappointment and anger aside and focus on his personal life. That spring, he asked Camille to marry him. After nearly four years together, and with a three-year-old son in tow, Camille Doncieux and Claude Monet were married in a small civil ceremony on June 28, 1870. He took Camille and Jean on a working honeymoon to the resort town of Trouville.
There, Monet painted his new bride on the beach. Everything seemed bathed in a bright wash of sunlight and air. Monet's paintings reflected none of his worry over money or disappointment over his lack of recognition. Out of his group of artist friends, Monet had been the only one to be refused by the Salon. But he wasn't the only one traumatized by the jury. Morisot was upset by the acceptance of one of her submissions, portrait of the artist's mother and sister. After completing the painting, Morisot wondered whether it was good enough to go to the Salon. So she asked for Manet's opinion, a request she would immediately regret. Manet said it was fine except the bottom of the dress. He took the brushes, added a few accents that looked quite good. Then began my woes. Once he had started, nothing could stop him. He made a thousand jokes, laughed like a madman, gave me the palette, took it back again, and finally, by five in the evening, he had made the prettiest caricature possible. People were waiting to take it away. My only hope is to be rejected. Bert. Morisot was devastated. First of all, she worried that the picture was no longer really hers. But then also, that concern just exacerbated the one she'd had before, which is that she thought it wasn't a good enough picture to go to the Salon, and she wrote to her mother, I'd rather be at the bottom of a river than have that picture shown. But Morisot soon forgave Manet for touching up her work. <laughs> to Morisot, Edouard Manet was a lifeline to the art world. At her mother's Tuesday night dinners, Morisot was able to get updates on the conversations that took place at the Café Gerbois. Conversations that she, as a proper upper-class woman, was unable to join. One of the things that's very difficult to understand about Morisot is how she could keep a pace with these young men who were having these lively discussions in the cafés. And so we have to believe that at these family dinner parties, Morisot was, if not showing her pictures to her new friends or looking at their pictures, that at least they were talking about painting and painting theory. And I always imagine this scene where to the left and to the right people are talking about the weather, the latest play, and meanwhile, unbeknownst to everyone at the table, impressionism is happening right there. But Impressionism was suddenly put on hold. On July 19, 1870, the Emperor of France, Napoleon III, declared war on Prussia. And all of France was thrown into turmoil. Frederic Basile was one of the first to answer the nationwide call to arms. He could easily have bought himself out of service, but instead he joined the infantry. As soon as Renoir learned that Basile enlisted, he fired off a one-line note. Triple shit, he wrote. You are a stark, raving bastard. Basile was sent to Algeria for combat training, but he seemed to think more about art than war. Dearest mother, I wouldn't be at all disappointed at seeing a real Arab village. I haven't seen a single palm tree. 
The Arabs are all poor and filthy. However, there's plenty here that would make for really lovely paintings. Frederic. On September 2nd, in a battle on the Prussian border, the French army was routed. Emperor Napoleon III was forced to surrender. Napoleon had completely underestimated the strength of the Prussian army. In Paris, a new government quickly formed and sent out a call for all able-bodied men to join the National Guard. The Prussians were marching toward Paris. Monet, not interested in putting himself at risk for Napoleon's folly, got on a boat at Le Havre and fled to London. His wife and son would soon follow. Degas and Manet enlisted. They were both assigned to serve in the artillery corps. Renoir was drafted and posted to a regiment of cuirassiers, the armored cavalry. Pissarro and his family were forced to abandon their home to escape the oncoming Prussian troops. They fled to a friend's country house, then made their way on to London to wait out the remainder of the war. Basile finished his training in Algeria, and by late fall, he joined an infantry regiment near Fontainebleau Forest. He wrote to his parents, trying to calm their fears. I am sure not to get killed, he said. I have too many things to do in this life. Within days of sending the letter, Basile's regiment was caught by the advancing Prussians, and he found himself in the midst of his first battle. It would be his last. Two bullets ripped through his stomach, and on November 28, 1870, Frederic Basile died. He was just 29 years old. The fighting was later described as a minor skirmish. It had no impact on the outcome of the war. Basile's father spent eight days searching the battlefield for his dead son. Finally, he found him in an unmarked grave and brought him home for a proper burial in Montpellier. When the news reached artists like Monet and Renoir, who were good friends of Basile's, that he had died, it was a moment of great sadness. He was one of their best friends. He was clearly someone that they had hoped to go forward with after the, the Franco-Prussian War. He was part of the inner circle. He was a driving force in the Impressionist movement a quiet but driving force, and he was suddenly gone. Prussians surrounded Paris and cut off supplies of firewood and food to the entire city. January 1871. My dear Edma, we celebrated the birth of the new year in sadness and tears. The bombardment never stops. It is a sound that reverberates in your head night and day. What suffering! 
what dire need. It is heartrending. Bert's health is visibly affected. With all my love, your mother. On January 28, 1871, France surrendered to Prussia, giving up Alsace-Lorraine and paying heavy reparations. But peace was not to last. Civil war broke out in early April. The backers of a left-wing Paris government called the Paris Commune fought street-to-street -street battles with the national government for control of the city. Before the Civil War ended late in May, tens of thousands of Parisians were killed, many of them over a few days that came to be known as the Semaine Sanglante, the Bloody Week. Many people were shot very summarily. Many people were exiled. Manet and Degas, according to Bert Morisot's mother, um, went through Paris at this time thinking this is the most terrible thing. Manet even drew a picture of one of these summary executions. The sunny, vibrant, modern world that had been laid onto canvas by a handful of young artists seemed lost to cold and darkness and desperation. But out of the darkness would arise a new France and a new sense of opportunity. The small group of Impressionist painters felt the time was right to take on the French art establishment and to challenge the conservative art critics. Their fight was to make art on their own terms, to create art that captured the modern moment, to not only survive, but to succeed, and to triumph. 